This week on the Lectures in History podcast, a discussion about immigration and working class life in the American industrial age. Northwestern University professor Kevin Boyle speaks about industrialization in the United States, class divides, and immigration in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm starting today with an ordinary man, Bartolomeo Vanzetti. His parents thought that Bartolomeo, which was his grandfather's name, was just kind of a big name for a little child. So as he was growing up, they called him Barto, or in the gentler moments, they called him Tumlin, which had a nice soft sound and made no sense whatsoever. On the 9th of June, 1908, Bartolomeo left his father's house. Two days before Barto's 20th birthday. Just to say, pretty much exactly the same age that you are now. He headed up to the nearest big city from his house. That's his house right there. That would be the door right there that he would have walked out of. Went to the train station, took the train up to the nearest big city near him, and from there he took the train across the border into France and all the way to the great French port of Le Havre. And on the 13th of June, 1908, two days after his 20th birthday, he boarded that ship, the SS La Provence, for a six-day trip to New York City for his immigration. When that ship arrived in the harbor in New York City, in the the port in Manhattan, the first-class passengers went straight from the ship into the city. But Parto was not a first-class passenger. He was a steerage passenger, third class. And the third-class passengers were loaded on ferries from the dock in Manhattan and taken over to Ellis Island for processing. He passed through that whole set of pens there. That's the way Ellis Island worked. You move from pen to pen to pen in a set pattern until you reach the front desk where they talk to you about your immigration status. The entire process driven by a little card that he held with him that had a number assigned to him. And when he had finally cleared the front desk, that's that front desk there is right up there under the American flag. When he had cleared the front desk, then you passed down a hallway, you picked up your luggage, and the next thing you know, you were back on a ferry taking you back to Manhattan. That's how Ellis Island worked. One of the great stories of Ellis Island is, of course, that people would spend days and days at Ellis Island. Virtually no one spent days and days at Ellis Island. It took you about three hours to get processed on a good day. That ferry then took him over to the southern tip of Manhattan, to Battery Park, if any of you happen to know, New York City, and he entered the United States. He was terrified. He didn't speak English. Battery Park was full of hustlers and con men because they knew all these immigrants were getting off the boat and they might need a place to stay. Or they might be convinced to buy something they didn't need. But he had an address for his cousin who lived in the city, and he knew that that's where he was going, to his cousin's house. He just had no idea how to get to his cousin's apartment. There's this big, complicated, elevated train. He had no idea how to work that, get on that train. Think of it for a second. You're a 20-year-old who doesn't speak the language in a brand-new country all alone. You don't know the difference between a nickel and a dime. He panicked, standing in Battery Park until one of his fellow passengers noticed this 20-year-old frozen with indecision and was kind enough to help him get on the right train to take him to his cousin's house. Here. That's the building his cousin lived in. In a section of New York, I mentioned in class last time, a place called Hell's Kitchen. Bartho Benzetti's tiny little share of the slums. Last time, 
I was describing to you the construction of the American industrial system in the 19th century and the earliest days of the 20th century. What I was trying to say is that that system was constructed in two ways. It was constructed with economic forces, and that was most of the lecture. And then it was constructed as well by sets of ideas. What I want to do today is I want to talk not about the operation of that system, but the people who worked in that system and particularly the people who worked at the bottom of that system. Now, I just want to remind you, I said this in class last time, that at the turn of the century, the majority of Americans were still farmers. And what I'm going to try to do next week is talk about the ways in which those people were also connected to the industrial system. But today, what I want to talk about is the people at the center of that system, the people who work directly in that system, and who bore its burdens. That's not to say that everybody inside the industrial system of the late 19th century was burdened by it. If you happen to be at the very top of that system, if you happen to be the owner of a major industry or the owner of, I don't know, a major bank, you could do really well for yourself in the industrial system. This is J.P. Morgan's home in New York City. J.P. Morgan was the head of the most important financial institution in America, the Morgan Trust Company, the most important commercial bank or investment house, really, in the late 19th century. This is the library he built for himself right next door. Have any of you ever been to the Morgan Library? It's a museum now. Oh, man, you've got to go. It is the most extraordinarily opulent place. So he would, it's right next door, it's that building next door, so he could get out of the house here and walk over to work right next door in this extraordinary opulence because J.P. Morgan, as the financier, the leading financier of the industrial system, was a man of incomprehensible wealth. It's stacked full of not only those classic books that he's got on the shelf there, but with extraordinary levels of art. That's the wealth that the industrial system could generate for people at the very top. That's not to say that every owner of the industrial system was J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan was one of the richest men in the world. But somebody like the owners of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company, they weren't living in this, but they were living with a degree of comfort that the industrial system could provide if you happen to be at the upper end of the American class system. Of course, that's a pretty small number of people. Below that leadership, that business ownership class, there was an expanding, a rapidly expanding middle class. This huge army of white-collar workers inside the industrial system, people who were, I don't know, accountants, clerks, salespeople, lawyers, or people who worked in industries that were connected to the industrial system in various ways. That would be a good example. I don't know. College professors. People who made good, really solid incomes because they provided the industrial system with the kind of white-collar work that it had to have. Remember I was talking about last time, one of the driving ideas of the industrial system is that you wanted to reduce costs as much as possible. Well, if you're going to reduce costs, come on in. If you want to reduce costs, you have to know what your costs are. That's what makes an accountant so important. He could tell you what their costs were for the ton of steel you're trying to sell. Those people were important to the industrial system. They were important to the industrial system in another way, too. This photo is a little hard to see, but this is a really kind of classic middle-class home of the late 19th century. And what's the thing that jumps out at you when you look at that? The piano. Perfect. You can even expand it out even a little bit more. Stuff. 
This is the stuff, to use a technical economic term, this is the stuff that the industrial system produced. A piano made in a factory that you could now buy with your middle class income. A nice rug, some nice furniture, pictures to hang on the wall. You earned enough that you could actually enjoy the bounties of that industrial system. That's one of the things that make the middle class so important in the United States. Not only do they provide important labor to the industrial system, work that needed to be done, they were the people who bought the stuff that a mass production economy produced. And mass production only works if there's a mass of people to buy the stuff. And the middle class did that. They also were able to afford, with the decent incomes they earned, luxuries that in previous generations would have been out of reach. Small things that we don't think about much, but are really fundamental. I'll mention just two of them. Indoor plumbing. You can afford a bathroom in your house, which means that you don't have to go outside to use an outhouse. You don't have to wake up at 2 a.m. thinking, oh, I kind of need the bathroom and have to use a chamber pot. That's a big deal. And by the last two decades of the 19th century, in a city like New York, at least, or a city like Chicago, you would also have the extraordinary wonders of electric lights. Anybody want to guess what was the first home in New York City to first home in New York City to have electric lights? Go for it. Right you are. J.P. Morgan was the first home, his home was the first home to have electric lights in 1880 in New York City. But very quickly, the electrical grid was extended to middle class neighborhoods in New York City so that by the turn of the century, if you were living in a middle class section of New York City or a middle class section of Chicago or, I don't know, Evanston, you had electric lights. That's a fundamental transformation of the way your life works. Changes all sorts of things just to have electricity. Which is a long-winded way of saying that for a good swath of American society, for the richest of Americans and a growing middle class, the industrial system wasn't a burden at all. It was this very exciting thing that was bringing a quality of life to you and your family that was unprecedented. And the industrial system needed those people. It needed them as working people in their offices. It needed them as consumers. But, and you knew this was coming, but what they needed more were people to work in the mines, to work in the mills, to work in the factories, to run the machines that made the industrial system work, to make those goods that middle-class consumers and the very wealthy could then buy. And when you move down to the working class in the late 19th and early 20th century, suddenly the industrial system starts to change in the impact it had. First of all, we need to take a step back. I know you all were really impressed with last class's PowerPoints, so I've just reused a couple of the slides. Last time, I described to you how there was a core industrial area in the United States by the late 19th century, a place where industry was really concentrated. And I realize that this is actually a railroad map, um, but it really nicely illustrates where that core was because that's where the concentration of industry was, the concentration of rail lines were. And so it ran basically from Baltimore up north all the way through, say, Boston along the East Coast. And then it swept straight west, and you can see it running straight through western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, running through Ohio, running through Indiana, Illinois, up into Michigan, all the way out to about St. Louis, and all the way up to about Minneapolis. That was the industrial core of the United States. That stretch right there is where industry was really concentrated. But one of the things I didn't say last time, but I thought 
I really ought to today, is the way to think about the industrial core of um, the late 19th century is that the United States, that section right there, is part of the industrial core that had developed in the late 19th century. And the other part were in Europe. And you can kind of see that on this map, that industrial core, look at the map over here, industrialization in 1913. You can see how the industrialization runs through Britain, through northern France, into Germany, into stretches of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Let me show you, this is a better map. Those um, non-green spots, those are the concentrations of industry in Europe. And you can see how Britain is heavily in industrialized because that was the industrial core that it spreads through Belgium in the north, spreads through sections of Germany, all the way out to Warsaw and Vouge. I just like saying Vouge because it makes it sound like I know how to pronounce words that aren't spelled the same way. And then it peters out. And the way to think about mass industrialization in the world in the late 19th century is there's a giant industrial belt that stretches from St. Louis in the center of the United States through what I just showed you all the way through sections of Western Europe. That's the core of the industrial world. And what happens is that industrial world solidifies and expanded in the late 19th century. What then happens is that it started to reach out into the periphery, into those areas of the United States, into those areas of Europe that weren't industrialized. So you start to get, for instance, railroad tracks running down into the south, railroad tracks starting to run into sections of the west. South in particular, the same way you get it over here. You get railroad lines that start to run down here into Italy, for instance, where it's not industrialized. And as that happens, what happens is that the traditional worlds of that big periphery all around the industrial core start to change. So you're a small-time farmer in Italy. When the rail lines come in, all of a sudden, you're competing against the big farms in the American plains that are flooding the market with grain. You can't compete. You are a shoemaker in some little town in Italy or in Greece or in Russia, and all of a sudden that rail lines are bringing in all those mass-produced shoes. You can't compete. So what started to happen is as that core industrialized, all the way through Western Europe, all the way through the United States, the areas around it, their economy started to decay. Because the ways that people lived in those areas weren't sustainable anymore. Everybody with me so far? Okay, half a hour, good enough. And so what happened was that if you lived on the periphery of the industrial system, you needed work. Because the traditional way you made a living on a small farm as a craftsman was disappearing on you. And what you do, what immigrants always do, what they do to this very day, is then you move to where the work is. You move to the core from the periphery to the core. And that's what happened in the United States. People who lived on farms, say, in Kansas or down in Mississippi, started to move to the center. That's why in the course of the late 19th century, the percentage of people who lived on farms started to fall. Because it was hard to make a living on a small farm, you move up to the center. But the American industrial economy was expanding so fast. It was growing at such a pace that there weren't enough people inside the United States to meet the demand for workers in the industrial core. And so increasingly, what Americans did is they also drew on immigrants from Europe's periphery. And to a lesser extent, though certainly it happened as well, from areas in Asia that were also industrializing, places in China, certainly Japan, though that gets complicated very quickly for reasons I'm not going to go into right now. So more and more, now this had been happening in the United States for a good long time. The first wave of industrialization, remember, is the 1830s, 1840s. First wave of immigration to the United States came almost immediately in the 1840s. A huge wave of Irish immigrants into the United States fleeing famine. A huge, even bigger wave of Germans into the United States fleeing political turmoil. 
But what's happening was they were moving to this new industrial core. By the late 19th century, those Irish people kept coming. Irish immigration continued all the way through the 19th century because Ireland was definitely, look at that, oh, high tech, man, look at that. <laughs> Ireland was definitely on the periphery. But increasingly, immigration to the United States came from the periphery down here, this huge swath of land in southern Europe and in eastern Europe. Immigration increasingly came from the periphery of this vast intensifying industrial system. And so immigration to the United States came increasingly from Italy, increasingly from Greece, increasingly from Poland, increasingly from Russia, as people moved from the periphery to the industrial center. You don't want to look at all of this, so please ignore most of it. But what you can see is the increasing rate. I love this, man. This is so exciting. You can see the increasing rate of immigration to the United States. That's, indus that's working people moving from the periphery to the center. And by the time you get to about here, about 80% of that immigration was coming from Southern Europe and from Eastern Europe. Now, these are the people that Americans tend to think of, to borrow the language of the poem that sits on the base of the Statue of Liberty, as the wretched refuse I know, of other people's teeming shores. Now, I just got to tell you, just as an aside, my parents were immigrants. They were in their 20s when they came to the United States from Ireland. Not in the 1840s, I would like to stress that. My mom, man, she hated that freaking poem. I am not anyone's wretched refuse. What do I mean? It's an insult. It's not meant to be. Americans think of it as a great tribute to, industrial, uh, to immigration. But it's the most insulting poem you ever heard. Or at least it was to my mom. And the fact is that, yes, some of the immigration that came to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century were, in fact, poor people. And they were certainly people whose family economies were struggling back home. But, and this is a part of immigration history that Americans also don't get in their classes very often, most immigrants from the periphery of Europe, from Italy, from Greece, from Russia, they didn't come to the United States. They had a European industrial core to come to. If you wanted to move to an industrial core from, say, Italy, what you could easily do is move to Belgium, which is a heck of a lot closer than moving to New York City, <laughs> and cheaper. So the truth is that the poorest of immigrants from the periphery in the late 19th century didn't come to the United States. They moved within Europe because it's a lot cheaper to move across the Alps than it is to move across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I'm not trying to say that there was no poverty among the immigrants who came to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century. It's just that one of the things that's really kind of important about understanding immigration is that to a substantial degree, immigrants who came to the United States tended to be slightly better off than the people who migrated inside Europe. They tended to come from small land-holding families rather than landless families. Because they had more money. They tended to come from trades, skilled trades, that were in decline. But they were skilled tradesmen. And that is actually Vanzetti's story, too. That Barto Vanzetti was trained to be a skilled candy maker. He was trained, he was an apprentice, he spent four years learning how to become a candy maker. The problem was, that was a skill, that's a skilled trade, certainly. The problem was that by the time, in the early 1900s, he actually got his apprenticeship done and he could go out and get a job, that that trade was in decline 
because the giant companies that had learned how to mass produce candy were flooding the market. Companies like Nestle, companies like Cadbury had figured out how to take the skill that he'd been trained in and turn it into an unskilled job with the candies made by machines, make it factory labor. Exactly the same process that had created the Industrial Revolution in the first place. What's to make it just a little worse for Bartow and his family, his father was a small-time farmer and a shopkeeper, actually. They're from right about there in Italy. And that region of Italy, it's actually a gorgeous region of Italy. They lived in a valley right up with the Alps on either side. It was a wheat-growing area. And in the 19th century, the great opening of wheat production on the Great Plains of the United States had started to flood the market in Italy. The money, the grain was pouring in along the train lines into their little town. And so the family's economy was completely messed up. He was in a trade that people didn't need as much anymore. From a region that was seeing the economic strain of mass industrialization. And there's a whole bunch of reasons that I won't go into. Bartolomeo Vanzetti um, left the country, because it turns out that immigration is not purely an economic thing. It's also tied with all sorts of personal issues. And believe me, Bartolomeo Vanzetti had a few personal issues. But it was tied to these transformations. Here was a young man, 20 years old, with a skill, with a trade, from a solid, respectable farm family, not rich people by a long shot, but not poor people either. not a poor person's house. Emigrating to the United States because he felt he had to. That's the story of immigration in the late 19th century as it is very much the story of immigration in the 21st century. People moving from the periphery to the center for all sorts of complicated individual reasons but overwhelmingly for an economic reason, because it's there that they're going to get work. And the United States desperately needed those people because it needed a working class to fill the factories and mines and mills and shops of this dramatically expanding industrial system. Everybody cool so far? Good. Now, there is one thing about the American industrial system. Let's move myself back. I just like this photo. I have no clue who these people are. I just like this photo because it is so amazingly respectable looking. And that's a really good symbol, too, of that immigrant wave. And I realize, by the way, that at least a portion of you in this room... I am talking about your great-great-grandparents. The thing is about the United States and the industrial system, wages actually were higher in the United States than they were in Europe. A working person, a working-class American, could, in fact, would, in fact, earn higher wages in the United States than he would going to Belgium, going to Germany, going to Britain. And that only makes sense, right? Because if the United States didn't pay higher wages, then all these people wouldn't come. If this was an economic decision, and it was, then the calculation was about that wage rate, that you could come to the United States and you could make more money than you could staying in Europe. And a huge portion of the immigrants who came to the United States, they never planned on staying. That's one of the other key facts about American immigration, at least in this period, People came for a couple of years and went home. Half of all the Italians who came to the United States moved back home. 60% of the Greeks who came to the United States at the turn of the century, they went home. You work here for a few years, you hopefully save some money, and then you go back to where you actually wanted to live. And as that rates of passage 
got cheaper. People went back and forth all the time. People would go back, members of Bartolomeo's family, for instance, they would go back, work a few years, they'd go back, they would find a wife because you wanted to marry someone from your hometown or from the region, and then you'd take your wife back and you move back to America and work for a few more years. It's in fact what his cousin was doing in that apartment I showed you. He had just gone back the year before to get married, and he and his wife were living in a tenement apartment. So the United States did pay better wages than most of the United States and most other industrial countries. Here's the tricky part. The problem was that work wasn't steady in the working class of the 19th and early 20th century. That it was a really rare thing in the late 19th and early 20th century for a person in the working class, a factory worker, a construction worker, a miner, to actually get a full year's work. Most factories shut down for some period or another in the course of the year, often because what they had to do was they had to clear their inventories. You'd made enough steel so that you had your warehouse full of steel bars, and you needed to reduce that number, so you shut down for a couple of weeks. And when you shut down for a couple of weeks, you didn't work. You didn't get paid. No one was paying you to not to get unemployment. There was no unemployment system. When you didn't work, you didn't get paid. And then the other problem that the United States economy had, and I guess you guys maybe will have some sense of this, it was really volatile. That the United States would experience a period of really dramatic economic growth, and then it would plunge into recession. It would plunge into depression. The year before, Bartolomeo came to the United States. We came in 1908. In 1907, there was a financial crisis on Wall Street. There was a panic on Wall Street. And when that happened, the American economy went plummeting into what we would call a depression. By the time that panic reached its peak in late 1907, early 1908, the unemployment rate in the United States was 20%. And there were literally thousands of children in the poorest sections of New York City who weren't getting enough to eat. So the way to think about working in the American industrial system in the working class, not in the middle class, that was stable and secure, but in the working class was that you had an economy that paid you better than you would be paid in other sections of that industrial core, but wasn't dependable and wasn't secure. So that high wage rate could, in fact, result in you earning not enough money to get by. Here's one example of it. In that poor, beleaguered city of Buffalo at the moment, which was a major industrial city, at the turn of the late 19th century, a family of five, according to really excellent social um, science research done at the time, a family of five in turn of the century Buffalo needed about $650 to $750 a year to have a subsistence income, to earn enough to keep them clothed and fed and housed. But a typical Italian-born immigrant laborer in Buffalo at the turn of the century made between $350 and $600 a year. So if he even had a small family, and believe me, in an Italian family of that era, three children would be a small family, he alone, if he had a common laborer job, in other words, he did construction work, shoveling snow, which... um, (coughs) clearing debris from the streets, if he had a common laborer job, he couldn't earn enough on an annual basis to feed and clothe and house his family. To make the problem greater, American industry was an incredibly dangerous place to work. And what made it dangerous was the very set of ideas that I was describing to you last time. That the industrial system worked on that premise, right? That the way to maximize profit was to produce as much as you could, as fast as you could, drive down the per unit cost, and maximize your profit that way. 
And I tried to stress with you guys last time, that's an idea. That is a concept. It is not an iron law of economics. You don't have to run your business that way. But once businessmen start to run the business that way, then it imposes on the rest of the industry the need to follow. And when that happened, of course, one way that you can cut down your costs, especially if wages can't be dramatically reduced, is to cut down on safety. To say to your ordinary worker, we're going to push you as hard and fast as we possibly can because we have to produce as much as we possibly can. You know the the typical shift in a steel mill was in the late 19th century? It was a 12-hour shift in a steel mill. You worked six days a week, 12 hours a day, and on the seventh day, every other weekend, you'd work a double shift. So you would get one day off every other week, and on the opposite day, you worked a double shift, a 24-hour shift in a freaking steel mill. And when that happened, of course, accidents were going to happen. To work in a steel mill, at least in a a good portion of the job, is to work with molten metal. And if you're trying to work as fast as you can and produce as fast as you can, and your employer wants to drive down his costs as fast as he can, this is what happens. People get maimed. People get killed. American industry was a charnel house. This, anybody? That's Triangle Shirtwaist Company. They occupied the upper floors. This is a modern picture. It was just before class. I was just saying, I was in New York, um, took a picture of the building. It's owned by NYU now, ironically enough. What happened, which you guys are reading about, in the Triangle Shirtwaist Company is the force of that intense need to cut your costs. That's what cost people their lives. The worst, most dangerous place to work in America was on the railroad system. Because if you're working with those giant cars, it is so easy to lose your hand with a coupling accident. And when that happens, you can't work anymore. And there's no one to protect you. Mines were also incredibly dangerous places to work. Because a gas explosion in a mine means that maybe 100 people would die at the same time. Steel mills were horrific places to work, but so were sweatshops. And so were places you don't think of at all. When Bartow Vanzetti got to America, his cousin got him a job. Because, by the way, one of the oddities, too, of our political debate sometime around um, immigration, you'll hear this maybe not quite as much these days, but a little bit, the horrors of chain migration. Migration is always chain migration. There's a very rare immigrant who would come to the United States without a friend or a family member. (laughs) Because you don't want to try to work your way into a new country alone. So Bartow came to be with his cousin. And his cousin did, who's already in the United States, his cousin did what a good cousin is supposed to do. Are any of you cousins? Like, no one's going to say it. No, I'm not a cousin. Of course, you're all cousins of somebody, most of you. This is your job. You have to get your cousin a job. And that's what Bartow's cousin did. He got him a job as a dishwasher here at the Columbia Yacht Club of New York City, which was up on Riverside Drive, up near Columbia University. And he got a job as a dishwasher in that fancy club, serving the richest of people, because I don't know about you, man, but I think rich people own yachts. But it was summer work. It only lasted as long as the sailing season was open, so it was seasonal work. And he worked there all through the summer of 1908, and then when the sailing season was over, the club shut down, and he was out of work. But by then, he'd made a few connections, and so he got a job here at Mookin's Restaurant. That was the screensaver you guys had to stare at all through class last time. This was a restaurant down near um, Times Square, big, fancy restaurant, actually. So fancy that if any of you go, which you should do this weekend, go to the Art Institute of Chicago, go to the Modern Wing, you can see this painting, which is of the inside of that restaurant in 1905, just three years before Bartolomeo Vanzetti got a job washing dishes in the kitchen. It was a fancy French restaurant. 
at the end of every night of service, when the owner wanted to clear out the people, he'd have all the waiters get out and sing the French national anthem, Marseillaise. It's a signal it was time to go home. I would sing it for you, but you really don't want that. It's a fancy French restaurant, but working in the kitchen was another story entirely. It's a dishwasher. Spent his entire shift standing over a tub of water, washing the dishes as it came out from the room. The humidity level was so high that the water dripped from the ceiling onto his head the entire time he worked. And he says the entire time he worked there, the drains in the floor didn't work up, so the water, the sewage, backed up every night. So that by the time he was done, the workday, the sewage was up to his ankles. And after a few, hour, few year, um, months of working there, he realized he could feel his lungs constricting. He could feel himself getting sick. And he knew he couldn't afford to get sick, so he quit come spring of 1909. Because he thought it would be much better if he could get outside work that would clear his lungs. But he couldn't. Couldn't get work. And within a month, with no work at all, he was spiraling down to the very bottom of the industrial system. He was spiraling into homelessness. And that, of course, was the great fear of the industrial system for the working class in the United States. The great fear was that, yes, you could earn decent wages. If you were lucky, the work would sustain itself and you'd be okay. But one thing goes wrong. A layoff, an injury, your lungs starting to fail you, and everything spirals. And so what you have to do is you have to think about how could you compensate, how could you give yourself the security the industrial system was not going to give you if you were in the working class. And one way to do that, of course, was to send your children out to work. Because if you can't earn enough to support your family, then you've got to have your children go get some work. Do you know when, I don't know why I'm asking you this, it's like history trivia. Do you know when the United States outlawed child labor? 1938. Ideally, you would have your wife go out to work, but a lot of the cultures that people were coming from, it was considered a terrible thing to have to have your wife work outside the home. So those young women who are killed in Triangle, they're not married yet. But you can get your wife to bring in income by bringing in boarders into your tiny little house. So you have a little apartment in New York City. You could get someone to pay rent to sleep on the bed over in the corner. And if you want to really push it, you could get two people to pay rent by having them sleep in different shifts in the same bed. Well, one's at work. One person gets the bed. When he comes home, the other one goes to work. He gets the bed. And what that means for your wife is that she's not working a 12-hour shift. She's working a 24-hour shift, and there's no day off. But you bring in the money you need to push yourself over to that subsistence level. And you try to get the cheapest housing you can possibly get. So while sections in New York City, like J.P. Morgan's house, have electric lights, not the poor sections in New York City. There are huge sections in New York City that wouldn't be electrified until the early 20th century at the earliest. And there were huge sections of the United States that wouldn't be electrified until the 1930s. And you didn't have indoor plumbing. That's what that photo actually is. It's a nice photo. But those are the outhouses. They're posing in front of the outhouses out back. And what that meant was that by living in those sorts of conditions, often really close to the wealthiest sections I said in class last time, Bartolomeo Vanzetti, that apartment he moved into, his cousin's apartment, that was like six blocks from J.P. Morgan's house. But when you lived on the other side of that class divide, what it meant was that you were running a lot of risks. This is the most dramatic one I can think of. Death rates from infective diseases in Pittsburgh's middle-class neighborhoods in the late 19th century was 17.7 deaths per 1,000. The same city moving on the other side of the class divide to the middle to the working class section was 44.7 per 1,000. Because if you live in poverty, you live with the constant risk of infectious diseases. If you don't have a decent water supply, if you don't have a decent sanitation system, that's where you get cholera. If you don't have decent heating, that's where you get pneumonia in a Chicago winter. To live on the wrong side of the class divide in the United States literally meant 
risking death. Of course, families, working class families, weren't actually completely on their own. What they had to do in order to combat this series of strains on them is they had to reach out beyond their family units, if at all possible. Reach out to other institutions that might help you out. I love this photo. This is Church of the Holy Family in Chicago. That's the church part there. Any of you from, didn't any of you go to um, Ignatius High School? Did you go to Ignatius? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's Ignatius High School right there down on Roosevelt Road, mm-hmm. and that's the church next door. When did you go? For my freshman year, 29th. 29th, yeah. All of my, on one side of my family, all of my nieces and nephews went to the same school. But they're older than you, so <laughs> there's no chance of an overlap in there. That's why I love this photo, actually. I just want to show their school. <laughs> this is the Norfolk Street Synagogue in New York City on the Lower East Side. It's gone now. One of the reasons why this great immigrant mass is connected so much to the religious institutions of the world they came from, Catholic, Roman Catholic Church in the United States was an immigrant church. The Jewish communities in the United States were immigrant communities. People connected with those institutions built these giant facilities. That's a big freaking church. (laughs) Wrong phrase. That's a big church. Was, of course, because it was a reflection of their faith. But it was also a fundamentally important social service. That in a nation where there was no government support when you were unemployed, where there was no workers' compensation when you lost the arm in the industrial accident, you turned to your church. And you can go all over Chicago, as all of you should, and what you'll see are those institutions rising up above working-class neighborhoods. They're everywhere. And they dominated the landscape because they provided, of course, comfort for working-class families in the comfort of ceremonies, in the comfort of rituals, but they also were a way that you had someone to fall back on when you lost your job. The St. Vincent de Paul Society, the... United Jewish Charities. You would also do your best to join one of the, or a lot of people did, the ethnic organizations that were common in the United States, the Sons of Italy. The Polish Alliance is a giant building in central Chicago. You see it if you come down the freeway. The Polish Alliance. They're ethnic organizations where you got to go and do ethnic things, right? Eat food that was from home, Get to meet people who are your fellow Italians, your fellow Russians, your fellow Jews, your fellow Catholics. But you know what those organizations also were? They were insurance companies. That what you could do is go to the Sons of Italy or the Polish Alliance, and you could buy an insurance policy. And insurance policies were a mania among the working class in the United States. You always had an insurance policy. Here's today's last trivia question. What was the most popular form of insurance that working class families in the United States, immigrant families in the United States, would buy? Excellent guess. Wrong, but an excellent guess. (laughs) The exact opposite. Funeral. Because there is nothing more humiliating than to lose a member of your family and not be able to afford the funeral. And then there were people, working people, who pushed for other forms of solidarity. And one of the reasons that I've asked you guys to read the Triangle book is because it deals with the enormous burden of industrialization for working people and the tragedy of that system for ordinary people, but also because it deals with unionization. That in the late 19th century, and we'll go into more detail on this, but in the late 19th century, the United States was roiled by class conflict as working people tried to join together in order to build unions that could give them a greater deal of security in a world that was so profoundly insecure. Because in the end, that was the essence of unionization, that you were going to find a way to get your circumstances to be a bit better by joining together with other workers. And that's one of the key stories that runs through the Triangle Book. Some working class 
Americans went further into political organizations to imagine a different world entirely. Radical political organizations. And the most common of those was the Socialist Party in the United States. Now, I'm not trying to overstate it. Socialist Party in the United States was never on the equal with the mainstream parties of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, but it also wasn't small. At its peak, and its peak came in 1912, the socialist candidate for the United States, the presidency of the United States, a working man himself, a man who worked, got his training on the railroad, a man by the name of Eugene Victor Debs, received a million votes in the United States. Because people saw in the Socialist Party, working people saw in the Socialist Party the possibility not simply of making their lives more secure, but actually remaking the system so that it was more secure for working people. And a handful, and it was a handful, believe me, of working people went one step farther, which is to bring us back to Bartho Vanzetti. In that spiral downward I described to you in 1909, a year into his time in the United States, he did, in fact, become homeless for a while. He left New York City, hated New York City, to be honest with you, and he went off to the New England countryside, and he became what was called a tramp, which is to say he wandered the back roads of New England asking farmers if they needed work, sleeping in barns. And then he finally landed a job in a town in central Connecticut, Middletown, Connecticut, in case any of you are from Connecticut, in a stone quarry, doing the most basic work a human being can do, breaking apart rocks in a stone quarry at the very bottom of the industrial system. And I'm pretty sure that it was there in that stone quarry that he first encountered... Now that's the wrong way of putting it, that he encountered again a political philosophy known as anarchism. Not just any form of anarchism. He encountered the most radical form of anarchism there was in the world, individual anarchism, that believed that the entire industrial system, the entire social system could be remade in a way that would give people, ordinary people like him, freedom and equality. And he was enthralled. That set of ideas, and believe me, we are talking as fringe a set of politics as you conceivably can have in the United States. That set of ideas so enthralled him at 21 that he made it his life. He devoted himself to that set of ideas, to actually creating the anarchist revolution that he believed was the way to achieve a more just society. It came to define him. And in the end, it killed him. But that's the story for another day. Have a good weekend. I will see you all on Monday. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.